Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, the importance of building business relationships with Paula Donnelly and James Hansen. We talk about the value of critical thinking and different skill sets in business, good design doesn't mean reinventing the wheel, and how their two dream clients involve pizzas and fighting. James and Paula met at Campus North, a now closed digital co-working space based in Newcastle, when James first founded Layers in 2016. Now five years old, Layers is growing with a team of eight and serving clients internationally. They both love their work and believe that anyone can be good at something with enough practice, but to be truly great at something, you need to love what you do. They believe that having an end solution that looks great should be a given and functionality doesn't need to be sacrificed for aesthetics. Their mantra is to work collaboratively with clients to deliver purpose-driven solutions, not just pretty pictures. So good morning to you, James and Paula. How are you both doing today? Well, you both? Very, Very well. good, thank you. you. Very well, thank you. Can you? Yes. So, always an interesting podcast with two guests. Mm. We're going to start with Paula. So when you were little Paula, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? That's an interesting question because I'm still very little. Um, so <laughs> maybe younger <laughs> is a better term. Um <laughs> I've always been interested in sports. So like, as a kid, I used to watch Gaelic football on the TV a lot. And I kind of wanted to be the person that used to run onto the pitch and help the people that were injured. So I applied to do physiotherapy at uni and didn't get the grades to get in. Mm-hmm. So I ended up doing sport exercise and nutrition instead. But like between physio and PE teacher, I didn't really have like a solid, I really want to be this when I grow up. I was just interested in sports. Mm. Okay. So when did that, when did that start? How, how young were you? I've always been interested in sports. So basketball net up in the garden, like we had a big garden. So I played a lot of football by myself. My two sisters weren't interested so just kicked it up against a wall um <laughs> but yeah I got in trouble from my dad for kicking the pebble dash off the wall and all that sort of thing but I was always outside um mm-hmm. and climbing trees and playing football and what have you so I've been involved in like various different sports throughout my life um and like most recently weightlifting and going to the gym and that sort of thing um but it's predominantly been team sports um as I said except for when I was actually at my own house and playing with a wall instead of another person (laughs) so so how many sisters have we got two two so uh, yeah I'm the baby of the house um one's two years older and one's 12 years older Oh, yes, we've, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm one of three girls and then a boy that came much later. So, yes, I feel like okay. I'm sisters. I, I'd say my mum would argue that, that I am the closest thing that she got to her son. Because, um, like, I was always into playing outside and mm-hmm. um, and being very, like, sport orientated. I always helped my dad out in the garden rather than wanting to help by inside the house and that sort of thing. So stereotypically, um, I was closer to the son that she never had. <laughs> so once you got out of studies then, what sort of direction did you take? Um... I kind of stayed with things that I was good at. So I was really good at languages and maths. Um, So stayed with them and loved science as well. Um, So as I mentioned, I applied to physiotherapy at uni. um, And to apply for that, you have to do two sciences. So I've done biology, amazing. Um, Chemistry, not so much. Um, And then Spanish. So 
as I said, loved languages and, and wanted to stay with that. So if I had just done the subjects that I was really good at, I might have taken a different direction. Um, but yeah, I hadn't really thought through the physio plan very well, to be honest, because I hate blood. Um, so I kind of got it in my head that you would go into physio and and be that person that ran onto the pitch um, and be very sport specialized um but yeah you have to do a lot of work in a hospital first so it's probably for the best that I didn't get the grades to get in yes the universe is probably looking out for you yeah so you grew up in Northern Ireland yeah that's right and then came across to Newcastle for university Uh, yeah I'd say Newcastle's home now I've been here 13 years um and I'll not lose the accent, but when I go home, <laughs> like my dad says, oh, you sound English. Like, no, I don't. <laughs> you don't. I definitely don't sound English. But I grew up in the countryside, so my family have very thick Northern Irish accents. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in comparison, maybe I do sound English. Um, so I'll not lose the accent, but I definitely see Newcastle as home. Um, and it's quite similar to Northern Ireland in the sense that like people are friendly it's quite close-knit like you've got so much on your doorstep like you've got the beach you've got mountains you've got the city like all within half an hour of each other um and people over here like to drink as much as they do in Northern Ireland so it's quite yeah, nice once made the mistake with trying to drink with three Irish girls <laughs> jeez no <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit. It's a bit much. It's the it's the bigger measures in Northern Ireland. We're well seasoned. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what we say about lockdown, isn't it? Yeah. We're not going to be able to. It's going to cost us a fortune to go out because of the the, the heavier measures at home <laughs> that are just oh, with the yeah. eye rather than a proper measuring. It's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> you sure, there's any gin in this? I can taste it. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, what was the what was the decision point after leaving university? So staying in the northeast? Um, it was more circumstance rather than like a an, a decision making process. So mm. I worked two jobs um in first year of uni. Um I worked in a bar, Travels Bar in the city centre. Mm. And then I also did door to door fundraising for charity. So travelled across the northeast, knocking on people's doors, asking them to sign up to monthly direct debit to support whatever charity I was representing at that time. And I did that. I made the decision after first year of uni to just do the charity fundraising rather than working in the bar as well. Um, And one of the main reasons for that is because it was more flexible um like I could do it the days that I wasn't in uni um but it also meant I could go out drinking on a night time rather than serving people <laughs> so that was like the decision making process so then after uni um I went full time with that there was better prospects in it so I became a team leader um I wanted to move into a management position but that wouldn't have been possible in the northeast i would have had to move away from the northeast so i moved job instead um but yeah it was more circumstance i had been in that job i was good at it i really enjoyed it i think the only thing i really didn't like was winter in the northeast knocking on doors is brutal (laughs) Um, but going back to how nice the people are like i knocked on the door once and this like little old lady was like I'll put your gloves in the dryer and you just sit and have a cup of tea and <laughs> you can leave once they're dry and you're warm. <laughs> I was like, I'll be cool once I reach the next, the next door. But it was just that mentality. Like I'm knocking on a stranger's door and they were like, I'll oh, come in and get warm. Like I'm not going to sign up, but I'll be nice to you. So <laughs> I love that job and I did it for five years. But as I said, there was no further progression for me without moving outside of the region um so yeah I made the very 
I suppose, difficult decision to leave at that point mm. because I'd, I'd made really good friends, loved the job, um, but I moved into a more corporate role in pest control because that's a natural progression from charity door-to-door fundraising to pest control. But um, again, re- like I loved that. Um, there was a lot of training involved and traveling down to London and that sort of thing. And it was very different and a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, it was like that side of things was cool. So cool. So what what got you to Campus North? So um, when I was at Renekill Pest Control, I had been there about a year. Um, first job in a corporate world, I suppose. And as I said, like, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really interesting. But the one bad thing about that is you were just a number. Mm. Um, so you could probably do very little work and no one would pull you up on it for a long time. Um, so, yeah, like, it wasn't really for me. Um But again, it wasn't a conscious decision-making process to leave. A very good friend of mine who you guys know, Lindsay Harbottle, she was setting up um, a sales team for a startup. So she had become their sales manager. She was just building a sales team and asked me to go and work for them. And I made the leap. I loved startup world. So got to do more than just one specific job, like got to do a little bit of everything. Mm. And although we were made redundant from those roles after about six months and we failed to raise investment, it just kind of made me realise like that's the sort of thing that I want to do. So I don't just want to have one specific job where I'm picking up the phone like 80, 90, 100 times a day, like I want to have more of a say in the actual direction that a business takes. Um, At that time, (laughs) I kind of knew that I had to go into a job straight away. Like, so there was about six months where I I was working for a startup um, after that, but I was working from home and I wasn't enjoying it. I had very little interaction with the rest of the team and the outside world. And sorry, my headphones just keep falling out. Um, So I knew I didn't want to work from home after that. Um, And there was that, that was a conscious decision making process. And I was like, right, I don't want to work from home anymore. This isn't the right job for me. I want to stay in the startup world. Let's start looking for different roles. Mm-hmm. And again, um, previous relationships led me to my next role. And it was Lindsay Harbottle again. Um, she had started working at Campus North. And Campus North, just maybe 60, 70 different businesses housed within this building. Um, a lot of them startups. And one of the startups was a company called Go Raise. So they had just been through the Ignite Accelerator program. It was still just the founder that was involved with the business and they were looking for their first hire. So Lindsay had introduced me, um, kind of brought me back to that charity world because it was a charity cashback platform. But it meant that it was that startup mentality and I could get more involved with it. Mm. So that's what brought me to Campus North. Um, I had met with Gary, the founder. I had done a couple of interviews and I was due to meet with my previous, er, like what was my current employer at the time on the Friday. I messaged Gary being like, so have you by any chance made a decision yet? Because if you have a, I would quite like to tell my boss in person and give him a notice. And he was like, you'd be the first hire. I don't want to make that decision 
hastily. Um, so if you can come back in on Monday, that would be great. I was like, right, okay. Um, and on the Friday, I handed him a notice anyway. Um, so <laughs> handed him a notice. <laughs> 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 handed him the notice I rang I rang my mum and I was like so I quit my job and she was like that's great and it wasn't the reaction that I was expecting she was like that's brilliant um you just it wasn't bringing the most out and yeah I was like right okay um I was like you know I don't have another job to go to and she was like it's fine it will work itself out <laughs> um and on Monday, when I met with Gary, then he was like, Also, oh, how'd you meet with your boss go? I was like, I handed him a notice. And he was like, What? Like, why? I was like, Well, regardless of whether or not it works out with you, I was like, I'm not going to waste my time in a job that I don't love. Um, and like, I'm not going to waste his time either. There's someone else that's better for the role. So he was like, When can you start? Um, he was like, I didn't want to take you away from like a, a secure environment, but while you're in this position, let's make a go off it. Um, so I was with Go Race for four and a half years. Um, and yeah, in Campus North that whole time. So made a lot of friends there um, and absolutely loved my time at Campus. Awesome. I think we should pause there because in parallel, James was existing, wasn't he? So, um, <laughs> yes. Um, so shall we go We go back to go to James and, and then we'll tell the story of how you, how you came to, came to be after. Worlds collided. I know, mm. the worlds collided. <laughs> <laughs> so James, you're a local, local boy, aren't you? Yeah, I'm from um, Consett uh, originally. Uh, I actually grew up in Castleside as a as a young a young boy, and then there was no one around. Um, there, it's just just me, my brother, uh, my sister for a bit, and then she went travelling. Um, our parents and uh, all of the retirees that lived around there at the time <laughs> wasn't really anybody else. Uh, <laughs> We moved to concert when I was around 15, I think, 14, 15. Um, didn't really change schools or anything like that, but it was it was uh, kind of uh, it felt like I was closer to where all the cool kids were <laughs> <laughs> um, at the time. Uh, I think anybody listening from Newcastle has been wondering how many cool kids live in concert, but um, that was, yeah, that's, that's where I'm from. Um, and did you know what it, what it what you wanted to be when you grew up? I am. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something um, sort of creative. I would have said like when I was young, I used to say I wanted to do something with art. When I was good, you know, it's, you're young and you're good at art. That's the subject. Everyone says, oh, you're good at art. Not really sure how many people make money as an artist. And then when I got kind of to that like stage where you get like careers advice at like school. And I kind of explained the kind of things I liked and I was told, oh, you should be an architect. They make a lot of money. And I was like, oh, I'll do architecture then. And then kind of like buildings, like drawing. It, it seemed like something, you know, like drawing was a big thing. Like you could draw stuff and that, that made sense. It sounded like a business. Um, and I did, uh, you know, knew I was going to do something like that. It didn't work out like that. It wasn't, turns out I didn't like architecture it's quite boring other than the drawing the uh the building um but yeah i mean like picking up on kind of what you guys were talking about with paul i i base a lot of my uh like gcse's and a level choices around the idea that i am going to do architecture um i did art gcse didn't do art at a level but at a level i did um maths uh, physics, um, psychology, and graphic design. Um, they were my... Didn't fancy like two years of like doing something easy then? No. Uh, I quite am. Um, so the other thing I think is like, as a kid, and I suppose I, like the bane of my my, my parents, mom and mom, because my dad used to work as an um, as oil rigger, so he worked offshore like two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on. Mm -hmm. 
You know, like the kid that always asks why. Like oh, I have God. a kid that like always asks why. Not just to like wind someone up, but just genuinely wanted to understand how things worked and stuff like that. So a uh, real kind of problem solving like mindset. And although up until about GCSE, I wasn't particularly good at maths. Like I was good enough, like quite clever enough to do maths, but I certainly wasn't top of the class. Mm. Um until I got a really good teacher in uh um when I did my A level AS levels um and didn't like without her help I don't think I'd have um had the confidence to do A level maths even though I knew that at the time I needed it for what I was wanting to do. And I love physics um because I just love working on how things worked, um that sort of thing. Um but um it, there's this leap between AS physics and A-level physics that was mm. quite interesting. Didn't do so well in the second year of A-level physics. I found it like, you know, I hate tests. Like, we mm-hmm. don't think that necessarily the best way to judge people on what they're actually good at. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But as far as tests go, I remember sitting in my final, like, I, comp- I don't think I got any score in my final <laughs> physics exam. And I just was reading everything going, where are the questions? Like, there was no questions that was just like statements and then it's and then it's a piece of like a, a, like a, a blank face for you to write something in and I'm like I have no idea what, what this you is. Want from me <laughs> yeah I spent two years and I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do here mm-hmm. uh it was quite and at my class I remember being quite across the board nobody did what they were well there was a couple of exceptional students which is great but there was a lot of us who did not do very well in that exam um but I actually found that I quite enjoyed psychology. I wish I'd actually done a bit more in psychology. Um, it's just, I did that kind of, uh, I think the school that I was at, was Saint, I went to St. Bede's uh, Comprehensive in Lanchester. And the way that kind of, you know, uh, classes were structured, it was like, well, you've picked those three. So your options for uh, your fourth are, and I can't remember what else the other things were, but they certainly weren't something I wanted to do. It was probably French or something like that. I definitely want to do that. So I did um, psychology. Um, but yeah, I would have liked to done a bit more of that, but I didn't. Um, and I just knew I wanted to do something creative. I ended up finishing my A levels though, and it was really weird because I kind of spent my whole school life kind of, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And then I finished my A-levels and I was like, I know exactly what I'm not going to do because <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it a little bit and it's crap um, <laughs> in my mind. It just wasn't what I wanted. So I was like, well, I want to do something creative. So thankfully my art teacher who'd been, um, to be honest, was quite annoyed that I didn't do A-level art. Uh, and I went kind of back and chatted to her a little bit about it. And she said, well, go to Newcastle College. Um, you do a foundation degree, a diploma, excuse me, where... You get to try like all the different sort of um, elements, and then from there, you, know, you can make a decision, specialise what you want to do. And I was like, all right. And even at that point, I, I entered thinking, well, I was going to do architecture, so I'll probably do three D design. Mm. Um, but just loved graphics design and visual communication, and was just like, this is kind of like the most simplest and quickest route to doing something visually that communicates a message. Uh, and I just, I found, I kind of fell in love with that and decided that's what I was going to do. Um, so on the one hand, I kind of, I've always known I was going to do, but that sometimes changes. <laughs> uh, and just kind of work towards that and just kind of see how it goes. Um, other than that, I mean, Paul mentioned sport. Uh, I was... I really longed to be good at football, to join in and play football, but I was terrible at football. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I did a lot of martial arts. Uh, so my dad took me to martial arts growing up, and it's, it's strange when you kick, because I did love it until I realised that no one that I hung around with did it. And I was like the, the weird kid that did like taekwondo and hapkido and stuff instead of playing football on a Saturday with everybody I was. I'd been doing it since I was very small, so I was like, as an early teenager, 12, 13, I was like going across the country doing black belt training sessions and stuff like that. And it was just mm-hmm. kind of strange. I, I kind of fell out of love with that when I was like 15 and I was like getting a bit independent. I was like, you know, I'm do what I want. And what I want to do is football. And then after a year of being terrible at football, I started to go back to martial arts. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And then it was again, as like, um, it was a small, short, short period of time where I kind of, 
thought about well, I did compete in martial arts so it hit when I did jump ahead at university eventually I, I did actually um start doing some other martial arts um kickboxing and um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and stuff and started to compete in sort of full contact stuff and uh really got into that like I was quite a I was going to use a diplomatic term, but I was an overweight, like fat kid, like, uh, and then I was still overweight and unhealthy. You know, I am overweight now, but that's that's we'll blame yeah. lockdown for that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> like, it, it uh, uni, I had a bit of a health scare, um, and then after that, I was kind of refocused and determined that I was going to um, like get healthy and fit. Found kickboxing, mixed martial arts, and um, presented you to did that. Got really fit, and then started competing, and was fairly good at it um and had a little bit of a bit from it, it kind of felt from being the person that no one thought in a million years would get into like a full contact sport um let alone fight in sort of a mixed martial arts match i thought well maybe i might do i might try this but then uh i, I really loved design and it was kind of like that's one of those things where I don't think you do it unless it's everything that you do if you want to try and put yourself through that. So mm. I think I kind of was happy enough with what I'd achieved and I kind of moved on to business at that stage, but kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, but yeah, always kind of knew you want to do something creative. That was kind of just the way that I was. But when you're growing up, you don't really know what jobs are there. So you just kind of work out as you go, I guess. Trial and error. Mm. It's like, no, oh, I quite enjoy this. So you're at Northumbria University, is that right? Yes, so I went to Northumbria University. Um, I did my, I, we, when you do your kind of diploma course, uh, they take you around different universities across the country. And to be honest, I was dead set on moving away. I um, just wanted to like go somewhere else in the country. But like of all the universities that we went to see at the time, Northumbria's program and this, this, just the presentations from the tutors was just, I just knew this was right, I'm, I'm coming here. Um, and we had all sorts, it was like, mind, you know, Northumbria don't like taking students from Newcastle College because they think they just want to go there because it's local. And I was like, so put them down as like a second choice. I was like, I'm putting them down as my first choice. Um, so I did, I got in, um, I think I was the, yeah, I was the only person from Newcastle College to go to Northumbria and I genuinely didn't pick it because it was local but at the same time and there was also a conversation with my parents where they were like oh so you, you just live from home I was like absolutely not I'll be, <laughs> I'll be moving out into halls uh, peace out bye bye <laughs> yeah I won't be staying in, uh, in, in my parents house in concert uh, but um, then that was a you know that, that was a great experience and this was some great uh, tutors that I got there as well Um some interesting tutors. Uh, Bush Hollyhead was my first year tutor. That was I, I didn't get to spend as much time with him as, as I would have liked because I, I mentioned that I had some health issues in the first year. But um, the, he was uh, he was this. They don't make them like Bush Hollyhead anymore. He was this kind of like uh, he did the um, Led Zeppelin logo. Uh, he did a lot of the Pink Floyd album covers. I think mm-hmm. part of his brain was still in that era at that time I think he left some of it there um, <laughs> he recently um, I found out on Twitter that he actually like, recently passed away but he was such an influential person to anybody that um, could kind of take that kind of like madness I think mm. he was a fantastic person to kind of like learn from and get experience from he was you know he was a character like no other um, and then there's Ted Carden who I believe is uh, still, still there at Northam University and just his kind of uh, attitude towards design, the process of design and kind of helping you kind of explore as much as you can when you're still at uni. Cause you know, you're again, like when you're a bit young, you're trying to make things look like what you see and you want to make sure that you can show that your work looks like that other person's work. And it's a bit like, well, the university you should try and do something that no one's going to pay you for when you leave here. Cause otherwise you'll never get a chance to kind of do it. Hmm. So it was just, getting people to hone their craft, think about what they're doing and actually put rhyme and reason to things. Uh, that's kind of one of my philosophies with design that like stuck was, you know, that, that was kind of stuff I learned from people like Ted and um, previous, you know, tutors that I've had uh, through Newcastle College as well. Um, the, the work, that, that was great. Um, 
And Northumberland University was a great experience. Met, uh, you know, made loads of new friends, and you know, at the same time, like you, you move on as from that time period as well. But it's just great to kind of, I, I find it's great to kind of meet as many new people as possible. You always learn something. You can, you can learn something from it from anyone if you kind of listen. Um, which some people might laugh at me saying because I think I talk more than I listen, but I do listen. If, um, <laughs> if, if For our listeners, uh, Paul is nodding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, Northam University, that was the next step. Uh, so how did you take those experiences into the, uh, into the real world after that? What came next? Well... The way design was when when I was at university, and I'm, it is now. Although there's kind of wider discussions, I think about what's acceptable. But you come out of university and you go and do placements. In fact, you do placements as much as you can in your summers, and then you come out of university and you do placements, and you tend not to get sort of paid for them. Um, and I went around the country. It's very hard, like to do that, but you got to kind of get some experience. And I think, like like even myself at the time, you know, you, you just want to show someone that you're of a skill set that would be of value to them whilst, mm. you know, trying to do the thing you love doing. Um, and a lot of the time you kind of come out of university, if you haven't done those sort of placements, you don't often understand the the realities of business. Like, you know, four months for a project's great for, uh, at university. You'll not get that on the same amount of work any any other time, um, and you'll be expected to do it within a deadline because basically deadlines exist to make creative stop trying to make it better in some senses, and in other times it's because if it doesn't go out there, then it costs someone else a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So you've got to kind of got, and I did that. It was some really good experiences, some bad experiences doing placements as well. But I think when we say bad experiences, I mean like certain people you definitely don't want to work with, but that's a great thing to learn as well. Start learning the type of business you want to work for, the type of work that you want to do. I mean, I mean, real work, like commercial work. Um, And I went to places like London for a bit, Leeds, Liverpool, um, end up here uh, before I got my first job. uh, And I worked for um, a brand in, uh, well, they were graphic design predominantly when I started. And they were kind of moving into more branding, which was perfect for me. It's what I wanted to do. And I, and I think I was a key part in their kind of transition to that, and which was uh, something else to think about to any sort of graduates or juniors when you're starting. Um, you know, I had friends who, moved, like when I, so I, it was uh, Surreal Creative was my first uh, job up here. Um, I'd had a couple of short-term paid stints at different places, but not like a full-time contract. Mm. And they were... They were a really nice group of people, um, you know, a team of about four, one, two, about four or five when I joined. Um, and relatively, though, I, I hadn't at the time heard of them and they, they, they weren't a large company. And I was kind of, you know, had friends who were going to these big companies and I wasn't quite getting there and it was quite frustrating. But then you get like a year and a half down the line and I'd been working for a company who really needed someone like myself working for them and actually doing work. And I had a new portfolio within a year. I had a new portfolio of, of commercial work. I had friends who worked for big companies who hadn't done a project yet. You know, they'd done some amends for someone or they tweaked this and they're like really wanting to get their teeth into something. And again, that's just kind of the realities of commercial work. Um, you need to kind of think about where you'll get the best opportunities and that can be a big company. It's just kind of the look of the draw. Sometimes it's just look after you, look out for your kind of own interests when you're starting out. Don't wait for it to come to you. I think you've just got to kind of go and look for that. Um, but gained a huge amount of experience uh, there um, and kind of stayed there quite a while. I was there about six years, um, and we, you know, we're eventually kind of doing work for. Um, the likes of uh, Stryker in uh, the US, we, um, Ian Smith, who's still the MD for uh, of Surreal now, you know, we go, go out and get them as clients in um, in Europe, Portugal, uh, Iberia. We could work around there. It was it was an exciting time. It was really cool. Um, the you know, it was a lot, lot of learning there as well. Um, 
and it was that whilst I became a kind of branding was kind of my specialism uh, I really wanted it to be seen and as the kind of world shifted um, where I think it's fair to say that in, like back then a lot of uh, businesses like Surreal had kind of grown out of um, the print based industry uh, and that wasn't the way the world was moving and really you needed to kind of represent your brand experiences first and foremost uh, when that was on online it would be seen now you'd probably just see on a screen like whatever that whatever that screen may be um and i was kind of acutely aware of that and I, I wanted to kind of move on and do more digital work i did you know look elsewhere and, and kind of moved on for a bit at uh, other other places but just didn't quite find what i was kind of looking for uh and also the going back to the um what's the word like that that problem solver mindset like my favorite and the idea of the type of work you want to do my favorite projects when it came to the, the, the digital side of things like i'm not a developer i don't write code that doesn't mean i don't want to understand the sort of fundamentals of what it is we're doing because mm. i want to be able to suggest something that improves the solution we were doing and we don't just do it we don't just do it this way because we did it like that the last time and that's a really good model in certain industry models to do things so you have efficiencies. Like we do it this way because we're really quick at it. Like that's you know fair enough. That's a kind of that's one business model. It's not ours, um, but it's more about trying to find like what's the best solution for th th this project. And that's kind of the more I kind of get older, I think that's kind of just a little bit about what interests me in design is the like problem solving part of it. Mm. Um, so that was kind of my move, obviously from university then into initial employment. And then uh, I kind of did a couple of different stints for digital, um, more digital focused agencies, but the, the, the kind of uh, drive to start something um, was kind of burning already. And I think at that, at that point um, I was, trying to work out how I was going to do it, basically, which I think is the other, what's the word, like, like fear you have when you kind of start out. It's like, what is the first step? Like, it's quite tricky. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my move from university into commercial design, if you like. So what, what got you over that fear? So... Uh, <laughs> As a bit of a cop out, uh, I was kind of uh, a couple of friends who I was going to start a business with. Um, we all were in the same sort of boat, you know, like we want to do things differently. We had this passion in that. Where are we going to get the money? So, like, right, well, so we were going to, we basically had a six month plan and we were going to work for six months, putting money aside to basically try and save ourselves like three months like running costs for us, mm. basically for our salaries. Uh, to, and then, you know, with our naivety in three months would have full list of clients by then. Really nice. Then you'd be fine. It'd be fine. <laughs> um, that was the plan. Uh, <laughs> and then we were doing this extra work um, as sort of on the side as freelancers to try and, you know, free time to try and on weekends, try and build up that extra cash flow. And in, in, in doing that, we met, um, well, uh, a client who asked, well, why, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this full time? I was like, we're going to do it full time. We're just saving up some money. And they were like, well, what if we invest? And then you guys can start. So they were kind of re-impressed at what we were doing. And um, they were looking for companies to invest in, diversify their portfolio. And we said, oh, all right then. Um, didn't really know much about how that worked, to be honest. Uh, should have probably looked into it a little bit more, um, but we just jumped in with both feet and then we've kind of cracked on with it um, since then. Uh, I say that, I did say there was three of us that were going to start a business. It was just me that jumped in with both feet. Everybody else waited. Um, one, of my one of my best friends, Andrew, joined me uh, six months later. Um, another friend, uh, Will, uh, he got some offers in the meantime that were too good to, re to, to refuse, which is totally fine. Mm. Um, uh, and that was kind of how how it started. Um, I just kind of was like, well, I'm ready to make the leap, so I'm going to do it. So I didn't want to lose that opportunity. So I did. 
had him at notice him. Uh, and then January 2016 was basically starting a business and needed to know where I was going to start from. And that's kind of where Campus North came about. Um, I know uh, Paul has mentioned friends recommending places and it was, I knew about Campus North through someone that I'd met actually at Surreal. So uh, Lindsay uh, Britton um, uh, was my partner and she said, oh, come down and check this out. And I remember going down the first time and just being like, what is this? And then I'm uh, thinking, this is great. This is, you know, it reminded me a lot of university, like mm-hmm. the kind of that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it definitely was something that really excited me. Um, I did try for about, what a week or so of like working from home and although I'm I'm much better at it now um at the time I, I, I found it very stressing working from home it was just like I've, it, working from home and I never left work <laughs> and when you start a business and you've got everything else going on and you're just kind of like right well it's the end of the day I'll go over there and, and, I, and I'll start watching the TV. It's like, you know, that works literally here. I can see it out the corner of my eye. Like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I didn't like it then. Um, Campus North was a great, great way to kind of co work in space and start out. And we can kind of chat a little bit more about that. But it was something I wasn't expecting and um, really lucky to have uh, been one of the people I think that got experienced that in Newcastle before. It kind of sadly isn't there anymore. I was like we missed out. Oh, yeah. the stories. Oh, you've been happy loads of times. Yeah. Yes, that's how I met Lindsay and Lindsay. That's it, right? <laughs> Another connection. Yeah. So was it and was it one of the Lindsays that then introduced you both? Um, that happened. Our desks were quite close together, Paul, weren't uh-huh. they? <laughs> yeah. Um, so our desks were pretty close. Um and I mean I, I kind of ran layers for a few years before um, approaching Paula, but as the business was growing, it was kind of one of those things where I'd kind of, I'd seen what Paula was doing and what she was capable of and how she dealt with different things. And the thing about Canvas North is it's like, it's really interesting because in, in a way, back when I was at Surreal, um, we used to be in uh, the Evolve Business Centre at Hortley Spring. There's other businesses there other businesses with complementary skill sets uh you know and there's just nothing there that fosters the interactions that are required for you to have those discussions and then there are also the kind of traditional feelings of like well we'll have to stop having this conversation now because we're walking past people who work for another company um and it's the opposite of that in campus Mm -hmm. go work and like People can hear what you're doing sometimes, which might sound awful, but um, they could. And you all kind of get to know each other. We had multiple community-type culture kind of driven events. I mean, a lot of them were drinking, but some of them weren't. And, uh, you know, often the uh, things like potlatch potlatch, uh, lunches and stuff like that were a great way if everyone to come around, bring food, chat, eat. But then you just find like you go for a tea break someone else go for a tea break you're having a problem if they've not had that problem before they know someone else who's had that problem and then that person comes and chats to you you know a big advocate of like learning from other people's mistakes wherever possible um mm. there's no point in us all doing the same stupid thing um if we can all learn from each other um mm-hmm. and you know i was lucky enough to jump way back to when I was at school and I knew I was going to be an architect and all this. Um, I did my work, I did my work experience. At, uh, I don't know if I should say the name of the company, like it was uh, Casey Engineers, um, which they were like a factory in Delves and they did uh, bearing, manufa- bearing manufacturing. I was given a clerical job and a pile of paper and an Excel spreadsheet because I said I wanted to work. They said I wanted to work with computers. I was like, it's not what I said, but okay. Um, and then, Smash through those, asked what they wanted me to do the next day. He said, that was your week's work. Do you want to try doing the CAD stuff? I did the CAD stuff. They were really impressed that I could do it. And they wanted to offer me a job. And I obviously wanted to go to college and do my design. And there's a really quiet senior guy sitting next to me. And one day, thankfully, he said, 
definitely don't take this job if you want to do what you want to do. So this is the situation I was in when I was your age and I've been here the whole time and I'm still doing this. It's not what I want to do. I've had my notice in on Friday and I'm going to go to college and I'm going to do what you're doing as a senior. As a, uh, and I was just like, oh, that's good. Like, like admit, like, feel good. But you're very more, godfather. It was a little bit, like, <laughs> Although I did, I did, um, <laughs> I do remember going home I haven't had the meeting with the MD whose face was like, his jaw hit the floor. And he was like, great news. We're going to have your job. You can go to college one day a week doing engineering. And I was like, no, thank you. And then like walked <laughs> home. And when I got home, my dad was there and he was like, did you just turn a job down? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it, it, you kind of need help from other people like that. That's kind of what I'm saying. It's not easy to do everything by yourself. And Campus mm-hmm. North fostered that mentality. Um, and sometimes people don't have the answers either like all they can do is give you their experiences um but at least in campus they did uh, and they did it kind of freely um i think that's that, that that is one of the major appeals i think for it for any startups and any of those kind of inky beer stuff where there's lots of different people there it's having people who've kind of been there and done it or or, or going through the thing that you're going through so you can have a conversation with them about it and not feel like that person's going to speak to you like you're an idiot. Like, it's just, you know, it's just difficult. So we just kind of help each other out. But yeah, that's where I met Paula. Um, and yeah, we were, we were desks away, like one or two, I think, uh, just behind me at times. Um, and yeah, you just kind of notice people who are just good at what, at what they do. And there was a lot of people like that at campus. It's, it was a really good, really good place to be. Awesome. So, Paula, did you realise that he was uh, scouting you out for layers at that point? Um, most of the time, I couldn't understand what he was saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have lunch together every day. So um, I mentioned before, like, most of the jobs I've gone into are through relationships rather than actually going out and seeking something. So I think that's probably been the same here it's not like James probably didn't know at the start ah like I'd like Paula to join layers in a couple of years time like it's just as you get to know each other and even like when we moved out of campus north into an office together literally being desks away um and having someone to bounce ideas off it's well, it's invaluable, really. Um, but yeah, I didn't know that I wanted to work at Layers. I didn't know that I wanted to work at most of my jobs until it happened. <laughs> I love that. Just going with the flow. Yeah. Taking I mean, she, did, she didn't want to work there when I first asked her. Anyway, oh, that's true. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's genuinely true. Because yeah. when James first approached me, he was like, did you want to do some biz dev work for me? I was like, nah. <laughs> um, and he was like just just part time you know alongside your other job I was like do you realise how many hours I do at the minute like no chance mm. um, but then yeah a little while after that um, you, James had asked me to come on board as, as a partner and, and actually help drive the business forward and that was the side of things that I was really interested in I knew the team I had a slight idea what they did um naively I thought I knew everything that they did and when I joined I was like this is a different language um so I enjoy that learning process um but yeah I knew the team I knew what what they were like and I liked them and one of the big things for me was I really like helping people so in my previous role being in the charity world I was like I really get to help people um but actually I get to help people in my current role um and help their businesses and help our team as well Mm -hmm. so it's just like it was difficult to kind of shift that mindset um no it's it's not charity work now but I'm still able to help people Mm -hmm. so but it was James that that helped me reach that realization i would say i think it's kind of a mutual thing in that like 
as you can tell, I think Paul has got a really good, strong set of sort of moral values that match a um, business sort of ethics. Mm. And there's a weird thing in Camus as well, which I would say when and it's not from a Camus point of view, it's when you start out on your own, like everybody does the cliche of like you wear, oh, you wear so many hats when you start a business and that. And it's like, yeah, yeah. But I, I love design and I'm really confident in my design abilities, but I also, something I should have said about both Northumbria and Newcastle University, uh, College and Newcastle University, had a, at the time had a really strong critic culture. So mm-hmm. you'd come in at the beginning of the week and you'd all talk about your designs and you'd get feedback on it. And you'd get told what people thought was wrong with your design. And that's cool. Like, that's good. That shows you the things that you can't see. Um, and it was weird because it's something that you need to have a sort of skill set to do it cr- like uh, critically and I found in um, campus when I started I designed something I'm the only person at the company I'd look around it'd be the likes of Paula or, or often I was quite close to Seoul I don't know if he was a Seoul um, from oh, what's Sand. Paul's web sand and you go oh, I've done this and it's blah blah what do you think you go looks lovely mate and you're like thanks ma'am like <laughs> <laughs> It's grand. Leave me alone. I'm busy here. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but it's just not the kind of same thing. And then that's true of business as well. Like, and with bringing Paula in, I, I don't want to put something forward and then just people just go, "Yeah, all right." And then it's like, like you know, Paula tell me I'm stupid all the time. He's basically and, saying I'm good at arguing. <laughs> <laughs> arguing your case for something. Um, and I can't remember that famous quote, but it's like that. You know, everyone's got. An opinion but you need to back it up with reasoning because otherwise well whose opinion are we going with it's not really there's not much point we want to be successful and we want our business to be successful mm-hmm. critical thinking the whole mentality of this with combining different skill sets early on in a project to make sure you know that and i was just chatting to a client that did it and you know she was saying the reason why they went with our quote was because we'd asked her loads of questions when everyone else had just told them how much it was going to cost. And now we were basically saying, well, how much does what cost? Like, I'm not 100% sure if we have actually worked out what it is you're doing here or why. Like, the other thing is, you know, we, it takes a lot of time and it's very difficult for us to make those decisions on which projects to put that effort in when you don't know if you're going to, you don't know if you're going to get the project anymore. And I'm used to, from an agency background, at times putting immense amounts of times into designs to put pitches forward that you never get a penny for. Mm. We Thankfully, we don't really do that. It, it, it is. It's not something that we want to do. But we will put the time in to dissect your brief and ask you whether or not you've kind of considered what you're doing for. Like, have you asked for this because you need it? Or is it, are you asking for this because this is the thing you think you're supposed to ask for? Mm-hmm. And Paula has just as much value and insight into that from her perspective and her expertise, you know, she's done sales, um, team management, marketing, customer service, uh, as I do from a design perspective, as our developers do from a technical perspective. Like, we want to get the best solution. We don't want to do the first thing that comes to your heads or because they've done it that way, so we're doing it this way. It's like, mm-hmm. what's the goals? Um, I think that was one of the questions that got us the investment was, I sat down with the, um, Martin Simon and sat down with them for their website. They needed a website and they kept saying they wanted it to be to work, wanted it to work. And I was like, do you mean it'll be on the internet? Because I'm pretty sure that's quali- like a quality of you paying. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they were like, no, well, you know, it needs to work. And I was like, well, whatever we measure today, if we launch it in three months' time, like, what are we measuring to see whether it's worked or not? And Simon closed his book and said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll talk about that at the weekend. It was all about that next week, and we'll speak to you next weekend. So we didn't, mm-hmm. didn't even discuss the website the rest of that meeting. So, um, I think it's that sort of mindset, and it it it's hard. It, it, like as a business, when you start now, it's hard to keep that going. When really, what you want to do is go. I don't know how much money have you got, um, <laughs> but it's it's hard. But you just got to kind of stick to your models, I guess. Mm. So explain to our listeners what you do. So you, you do it a slightly different way, don't you? I think so. Yeah. Um, um, so we take a collaborative approach um, to problem solving. Um, as James mentioned, um, 
we find out what the goal is and involve our entire team from the offset and throughout on a project. So rather than a client telling us what, what they want, they tell us what their goal is and we tell them the best way to get there. So it's more collaborative and, and consultancy based. Um, so yeah, that's, and sometimes we'll advise like, you, you don't need us. Um, it's in our best interest to do that because we want long-term relationships with our clients rather than like a one and done sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned before about like the importance that relationships have had on, on my whole career, but it's true like of layers as it stands now, our relationships are the reason that the majority of our work comes to us. Um, so mm-hmm. it's, it's worth fostering them and nurturing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like Paula said, the word consultative there as well, but consultancy in it's kind of, we don't, I, I don't, I never really use that word start now, but I suppose that makes more, more, more sense in, in that initial approach. Um, but it's just the other models that I've kind of worked with some of the, the sort of digital agencies are, are very like product based. And I suppose it's kind of okay if that's what you, you know, if you've decided that you do this, this is the thing, the one thing we do, like this mm-hmm. website or this type of website, or that and it becomes a lot easier to sell, but you end up getting into a, a workflow where a salesperson makes the sale. The designer then gets the brief when everything's already been agreed. So it's the first time I'm seeing it. Um, I then have to design to that brief. And then if that goes okay and nobody along the way suddenly has the epiphany that, wait a minute, we're designing the wrong thing. It's like, right. Uh, That then goes to a developer who sees it for the first time when the designs are finished and they're like, well, great. Thanks very much for involving me. But that is a really efficient factory line that you can kind of put stuff out and you can grow that and scale that. But that sounds boring to me. So I didn't really want to do that. Um, (laughs) Uh, and, it, and from a design from a design point of view, you, you, getting efficient at your design often just means like you look back after a year, and everything design's the same, a different color or a different. Like it's not it's not good um, for your creative men, mentality. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, and we have to look with like when as Paul is saying, like what what is it they're trying to achieve. We have to still try and achieve that within clients' budgets and timelines and within the reality of business. It's not, you know, we're not, um, we're not artists. Uh, which is <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. Yeah. Awesome. So we, is there anything else we need to talk about before we lower the tone slightly and move on to the quick fire round? Oh, I'm looking forward to lowering the tone. <laughs> It's, it's not that low return, actually. Sorry. Could have been a bit more edgy. I know, we need to be a bit more edgy. <laughs> so, James, we're going to ask... You can ask two questions and then we'll take it in turns to answer. Yeah. So. so, question one, we'll put this to Paula. I can take the Inspiration North lamp. <laughs> we rub it, the genie comes out, and you're granted a wish to have any dream client that you could choose in the world in the world who would you choose Papa John's Papa John's um, mm. yeah so we've we've actually talked about this before um, Papa John's and the UFC were on there but for me it's Papa John's I love their pizza like genuinely love it but every time I go on to order it just frustrates the life out of me like their website doesn't work I end up getting booted out it's like no you can't log in and then it's like <laughs> um you need to create a new password but um you have to use hieroglyphics to do that and it like it just really winds me up so I end up not ordering with them and I'm like how many other people are feeling that way like you're <laughs> You're doing yourself out of business. So, yeah, if if you know anyone at Papa John's, we would love to help them. <laughs> I love that. Love it. Always be pitching. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Same question to contender number two, please. 
Well, just because Paul is genuine uh, that I put the UFC when I when I was like, I'd love to do some of the UFC. And that, like, mm-hmm. as I said, I did a lot of martial arts uh, in my younger years. I have a lot of respect for all of that in, as a sport. And uh, to be honest, I've not been on their side for a while, so I, I'm, I wonder what it's like now. But it just, just felt like it fell such so short of what it could be for mm-hmm. the assets that they had. And I could just see like a lot of possibilities for just making it cool. And as far as brands go, like for making your site cool, it's like that one will that one will do. Mm-hmm. I remember they did the Reebok deal years ago now, which is just going to an end, I think. And I with many fans at the time was so disappointed at the Reebok stuff that came out. I was like, oh God, this is kind of predictable and mundane. But um yeah, that was that was the one because I just thought so much stuff I would like to look at from a from the the website itself, the, p- the possibilities that you could look into for increasing fan engagement, not just as a website, like as like you know extended apps and things like that, and what they could tap into. Um, I just think there's a lot, there's a lot there, and for 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 a brand itself, it has such good assets mm. um, that you could play with in content. Um, yeah, that was. That was what was on our board. I can't remember what the other one was, but that, that, that was, was the the only two I think that yeah, we put so up: P- Papa Johnson, P- UFC, pizzas, and fighting. Is that what we put <laughs> on the board? Love it. <laughs> they go hand in hand. Yeah, for, yeah. have a fight and have a pizza. <laughs> Teenage Mutant yeah. Ninja Turtles. You know, <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> Okay, question number two. We'll go to James first. If you could live anywhere in the whole wide world, money was no object, where would you move to? Oh, my initial instinct was going to say, I I wouldn't want to be one place. I'd want to just constantly be like a month in a city and just keep moving. doesn't sound very economically friendly, like if I get an elect, like a a green energy jet. But um, yeah, I think that would be, like ideal I really like like I said meeting new people new experiences new places um, mm. I'm lucky enough to have done a lot of travelling uh, well I say that not kind of like travelling like I mentioned my sister went travelling she's rode a kayak up the Amazon River I've not done that but I've been to like you know Thailand and my wife's from Hong Kong and um, been the um, yeah, growing up I got to go to America a lot my brother lives in California now um, I'd like to kind of be able to do a bit more seeing of the world. I think there's a lot out there. Um, we just think that what we've got on our doorstep is what's reality. And I think it's a lot more to see. So that would that would be my dream, I think. Who uh, would the first three cities be then? Um, i trying to think of places that I've, I've not been that I'd really like to go to. I'd like to go to Canada, so I've never been there before. So maybe like t- Toronto. Um Australia, I've never been to, so Sydney, probably see the Sydney Harbour. Mm. Um, or uh, Singapore, maybe, or uh, Abu Dhabi somewhere in the Emirates. I've not been, I've not, I've not been to the Emirates, so yeah, I think mean, that would be three on the list to go and try. Cool. Good choices. <laughs> mm. Awesome. Same question, Paula. Concert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. I think the last year has basically said we can work from anywhere. Um, so I like where I live. Um, I really like where I live. By the beach, like um, half an hour on a flight to go and see my family. Um, if I was living on the other side of the world, it would make that extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would also mean that your holidays are consumed by visiting family. And it's feeling like an obligation then rather than a holiday. Um, so I quite like where I live, um, but I would want to travel more. Um, and that includes places on our own doorstep. So never really appreciated in Northern Ireland until I moved away. And now I, every time I'm home, I'm like, let's go somewhere new. Um, and even like looking forward to next year, going to a friend's wedding in northern ireland and we're like well we could spend a month like traveling around the north and south of ireland um and like my partner he's a a graphic designer as well so he can work remotely um but yeah 
I wish I'd done more traveling when I was younger, when I had fewer responsibilities. Um, but it's not to say that I can't do that now. Um, I just, I really like having a base to come back to, but I do want to travel more. Cool. Yeah, like that idea. And it could be, it could almost be, you keep your base, but then the travel and working from somewhere else is like your creative inspiration. So I'm going to go to Berlin for a week or I'm going to go to um, Barcelona. Barcelona, yes. That's a good I one. think being with B, Bob. <laughs> I'm going to go to Bahrain. Bergen. Budapest. Budapest. <laughs> nice. Cover all the Bs. Yeah. And then, and then come back refreshed and recharged and have lots of energy. Mm. Mm. My, my old boss um, still lives in Chamonix in France and when I went over to visit and stay with him for a week, I think that was my first experience of actually working away from home. Um, and it was the first time that I was like, actually, I could I could quite happily live somewhere else. Chamonix is really expensive, so I'm not going to move there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it definitely made me think, well, I can work from anywhere. So maybe that's more of a possibility. Um, and like we could go, sorry. No, I'm just yeah. laughing. No, I'm just laughing because we were asked like if we could do anything we wanted and both of us gave like practical answers. You were just like, well, you would have to, my holidays would start to come. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, we do need to think about the environment. Like it's a bit, um, <laughs> you can tell we're kind of uh, practical thinkers. <laughs> yes, a little bit. <laughs> I think, well, that's the thing, like, if you have all the money in the world, I'd still want to do some sort of work. Like, oh, I was having this chat with James yesterday, and my mum, when I went back to Ireland last week to visit, she was like, no, if I, if I won the lottery, like, I'd pay off your mortgage, but I wouldn't give you enough to stop work. And I was like, that's nice. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And um, she was like, nah, you'd get bored. Like, you'd get really bored. You need something. I'm mm. like yeah you're right like I really do I enjoy my work I enjoy the company like I definitely need it but I want to see more and experience other cultures but with what we're doing it's completely possible and then I get to come back to my base and enjoy it so yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like no place like home <laughs> yeah <laughs> to travel to see Papa John's in the US yeah. <laughs> Do you want to ask the, the final person? question? Yeah, so the question we ask all our guests, should we go back to James? Yeah. So if we could take you back in the DeLorean to meet your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give? Do it. I don't want to do it, just do it. Um, I think I spent a lot of time trying to work out what might go wrong and like whether or not I could do something and you know, what's the plan. That kind of thing, I think, gets passed on from... My parents a little bit, my mum's a bit of a worrier, but I think um but as a, as a, as an example of that, like I love the holidays having family, really loved them, but for who I didn't know that going to the airport wasn't that stressful until I think that was about um it was after the Christmas of so I, I was ill. Um I had colitis um in college and then I came back and um University and when when I kind of got through, I, I had my like final meeting with my um, doctor, and he said uh, you could fly tomorrow if you wanted, and it was nearly Christmas. And I went to a back MSN Messenger days. I was on MSN Messenger, and um, said to my friends in America who had met university, and said I could fly. And one of them said, "Well, you just come over here for Christmas." And I was like, "All right." And I think that was the first time I just think I'll, I'll do it. And I was really worried about like flying, especially like you know, I've it wasn't they have all of the added security. It's dead easy. You just went in and then you got on a plane and you flew. I don't understand why growing up, honestly, it was the most terrifying <laughs> experience just because <laughs> my mom was just so worried that we would miss the plane, that we wouldn't have everything, everything was packed. I I'll don't think four I hours least, early. <laughs> at least, at least four hours early, uh, you know, just to make sure we don't, they don't leave without us. I'm not sure that's how planes work, like four hours. Um, but yeah. Definitely just do do more and, and get out there, travel more, get more experiences. Less worry, I think. I would but, a worry. My parents, were, we lived in Northern Ireland growing up, and my parents used to literally drop me on my own at the age of like eight 
at the airport I just get on get on a plane on my own and then get off and my grandparents would meet me at the end so it's like <laughs> I would never put my 11 year old on a plane <laughs> my, uh, my my wife mentioned one she was um she was from Hong Kong and um uh Taiwan she went on a holiday to Taiwan with a friend when they were like 15 and I was like with your parents she was like no no I was like what <laughs> uh <laughs> And apparently, I was. I remember saying that to her, and she just like went, "No, but my parents told the people at the other end that we were going an hour on." I was like, "Oh, in which case, you'll be totally fine." Like what? <laughs> like, yeah, that definitely, I definitely wouldn't have been on my on, on my parents' list. And I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just, I don't know, it's just a kind of a different mindset. I think um, I was certainly sensible enough to look after myself. I just didn't trust, didn't back myself, back back myself. Mm-hmm. Before, I think. But, yeah. Don't be daft, like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, Paula, getting in a time machine just to mix up a bit. What advice would you give to your eighteen-year-old self? This one's a really difficult one for me um, because I genuinely think that if even the slightest thing had been different, then I wouldn't be the person that I am now, and I. I don't know I quite like the way that my life is the friends that I have all that sort of thing and I don't think I would necessarily want to change that um like I, I think the lessons that I've learned and whatever that's happened what seemed late at the time or seemed traumatic at the time but it's like I wouldn't necessarily be the same person that I am had those things being different I'm not really one for changing the past no so, so sit down nice nice uh, Papa John's yeah. pizza yeah I might just be like <laughs> wait until you're 30 it's unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> I love it Keep the suspense yeah I'm not going to tell you anything <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant so for our listeners if you would like to follow James and Paula's work the great brands that they are working with then go to the website layers.studio we have really enjoyed chatting with you today so thanks for joining us thank you thank you thanks for having us thanks everyone for listening check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person if you like this subscribe and tell your friends if you didn't like this subscribe anyway and tell everybody